you cross the pill bridge above the Tor into the junction, the end of the North Devon Line. Ending now where once in August 1854 High hopes speaking, and nothing of them now but a tenuous link with Exeter, but memories all the way. Steam traction never fails to invoke a memorable response. There's something about the power of a steam engine that will always inspire a feeling that man, despite his failures, managed to create a living masterpiece when he produced these giants of engineering. So much so that today, as the world faces the 21st century, steam still holds a vital place in the memories of our hearts and the archives of our heritage. This film pieces together, with the aid of unique Archive 8mm footage, a portrait of the Exeter, Barnstable and Ilfracombe railways. Inspired by Brontons' Victor Thompson, the images will take us on a journey into the past and back along some of the West Country's most beautiful North Devon lines. The Exeter to Barnstable Railway, still in operation today, has been lovingly named the Tarka Line, since it spans part of the Tarka Trail, a long-distance route of some 180 miles that is frequented by walkers, cyclists and regular train services through countryside so beautiful that it partly inspired Henry Williamson to write the novel Tarka the Otter. The journey begins at Exeter Central Station of the former southern region and as expresses moves slowly down one of the steepest gradients in the west country towards Exeter St David's. They were often headed by two G6060s acting as returning banking engines ready to haul the next express back up the incline. From Exeter St David's, the train headed towards Cowley Bridge Junction, leading to Newton St Sires, open to serve the village of the same name in 1851. Today it is one of the line's request stops. Crediton is a quiet country station, but in 1928 staff issued 19,788 passenger tickets and received an annual parcels delivery of just over 10,500, giving some indication of how times have changed as railway systems have degenerated. Yeoford was a busy interchange station until the end of the steam era, with extensive sidings and freight traffic. Today, another unstaffed halt. Just one mile from Yeoford, the lines divide. Oakhampton and Plymouth to the west, and the other to Cobblestone, the highest point on the line from Exeter where the country station is situated at the main road junction of Oakhampton and Barnstable. Then on to Morchard Road, built to serve the village of Morchard Bishop, just over two miles to the east. Today another insignificant request stop, but in 1928 over 200 passengers frequented the station on average each week. Lapford, close to the River Yeo, still enjoyed freight deliveries of fertiliser until 1993, when road transport proved a worthy competitor, leaving this beautiful country station, today with its private dwelling, a grim reminder of the decline of the railway network. Exford, the only passing place apart from Crediton on the line, is near the famous Forest and Exford House. It is here that the Tarka Trail really begins. Near Junction Pool, mentioned in Tarka the Otter, is the station of King's Nympton, just a little way from the Nympton Park estate owned by the Wildfowl Trust. 
Here, passengers are provided with a bus-type waiting shelter which stands conspicuously before the former station building, now a private dwelling. Portsmouth Arms was named after the 4th Earl of Portsmouth of Exford House, and the station has, since the decline of steam, gradually been relegated from a busy country station to an unstaffed request stop. Umberley Station was the beginning of the part of the line to Barnstable known as the Tor Valley Extension, opened in 1854. In 1936, well over 200 passengers a week used the facilities and the station had a very busy freight section including livestock. And finally, Chapelton, dating back to July 1857 and situated on a limb with hardly a dwelling in view other than the old station house which is now a private dwelling. The station comes alive on one Sunday in each year when the steam fair is held nearby and numerous visitors arrive on the special rail service. Then into Barnstable, today the end of the Tarka line from Exeter, but as we shall see later, once a busy junction buzzing and alive with activity. And it was just over 25 years ago that Victor Thompson was so concerned about rumours of the possible closure of the line from Exeter that he made a film of the journey, a visual memory of the line he so loved. It began down in the hole the cutting below Exeter Queen Street, a railway yard like a royal parade ground. For all the majesty of the southern came here, King Arthur, Sir Kay, Morgan Le Fay, a sort of turn round table after the crusade from Waterloo. And from here, engines with regimental numbers took the war west of the Creedy, through the North Devon outback to forge a link with Arthur's seat at Tintagel. The old green banner of the southern still has the air of a mission. And where else but a cathedral city would put an altar rail around a departure bay? But Camelot has been lost. The links are overrun. Furthest outpost pushed back to Barnstable. But you still drop down from Central along the right hand curve of the Exeter incline to dive through 200 yards of echoing tunnel. A squad of banker engines patrolled it, escorts for the Devon Bell, the Atlantic coasters. And driver Proust remembers the double headed blast bouncing off the roof, swamping the cab and knocking a young fireman flat with noise. For a moment you hover over St David's before the swoop down to the old Great Western Line. Brunel's six-footers lorded it down there, granting a passport to southern trains from here to Cowley Bridge. So you come into St. David's with that keep-to-one-side, immigrants-only feeling reserved for Platform 4. For God's wonderful railway is still there, as plain as the concrete letters over the station entrance. Too deep for new brooms. The intercities clatter up from Cornwall, bound for stops with the old western names, Cheltenham, Westbury, Reading. The old water tower is a monument to the steamers, when long distance crews bedded down in it. Dormitories, roofed over with a few thousand gallons of water. New men were warned, if you have to get up in the night, don't pull anything. There's no steam to smother the footbridge, but enough sunlight and suitcases to give that old excitement of a mainline stop. And you'll remember a different time, a time beyond compare, when high days began on high platforms and ended with a flash of sea green beyond the latticework of the home signal. At the northern end of St. David's is a controlled crossing where main road traffic tries to beat main line trains. 
the barriers snip off the passing parade with every notch on the timetable. You can't raise a camera without someone putting on a daily act hell-bent on suicide. The road north is hemmed in by stockyards on both sides for a mile and a half to Cowley Bridge. The landlords always reserved the right of way with scant regard for southern trends. Guard Jimmy Beer remembers shunting 30 Barnstable wagons across this main line, just two minutes ahead of a Plymouth Express. The kind of thing turns a young man's fancies into thoughts of insurance. Cowley Bridge, where the Taunton Road will swing away to the right. So let's look back along the train to see that main line swerve northwards. Once over the viaduct, the stretch to Crediton is flat upland country with a slight down gradient to help the timetable. Driver Tom Davy remembered how southern timings were tight with a running time for each section. Losing a minute on one meant making up for it on the next fast stretch. But some of the guards wouldn't flag an early start. They'd keep the train sitting there strictly to schedule. Until the very last lap, no guard could control a driver who wanted to set up a record, say, from Chapleton to the junction. Newton St. Sires, with only three trains daily. In the old days, it was a good stop for tips. Being the last stop before Exeter, London passengers wanted time and to spare for the changeover, with a bit of change over for the guard. One traveller arrived at Exeter to see his Waterloo disappear up the incline. Driver, what went wrong your end? I tipped the guard my end. <laughs> I'll tell you what, sir. You tipped the wrong bloody end. Crediton. Six lorries once served the yards. Besides the farms, there were factories in the town making sweets. So there was an assorted mixture of comings and goings with grain, fertilizers, machinery. And there's a Victorian box with the same kind of old fashioned hospitality where we together watched the ballast train come up from the railway's own quarries at Meldon. The box holds a watching brief on the 15 miles of freight line, besides controlling another 15 of the Barnstable line, down to the nearest passing loop at Eggsford. Out of Crediton, we eased to the right, as if to make room for all those ghosts. For over there ran the Plymouth part of the Atlantic Coast Express, cresting the Dartmoor purple to the blue of Plymouth Sound. And wartime trains took the safest West Country route through Yeoford, where there were no quiet nights for signalmen. New rails spread out to take American Red Cross trains until D-Day with blood-red benedictions on each coach. And here it is, Yeoford, and no time to stop, for it's all quiet nights and days without signalmen.
Past Yeoford is the site of Colford Junction, where the old Plymouth line will part company. There it goes, leaving us on the one remaining tendon of the withered arm. Once, ten daily services, seventeen on Saturdays, brought the summer crowds to Torridge and beyond. Coaches packed with the sand dwellers up to Morto and Croyd, and the first class travellers for the hotels down in Coombe. And once, way back in the thirties, all those plus fours and tweed for the little Linton trains, which whistled away through Barham and got lost in Exmoor landscapes. Lapford, with a platform offset on each side of the Exeter Road. So let's look back at Rail Clark Frank Beer's memories of those best kept station awards when country staffs filled out station names in pansies and pebbles. Lapford was five times champion, while well, most of the working parts went with the flowers, though up the road some of it's still in partnership giving an all day all clear to Sharps Express. The foul veil gloom of a decaying halt shares the summer silence with deserted yards. The old dairy factory closed years back. The building is a store for second-hand goods, used bargains in a worn-out siding. But from here to Exford, the route is all summer green, laced with the loops of the tall. The new box at Eggsford stands on the bank of the Tor. The old one resisted the impulse for years, then took the plunge, helped out by a dredger which knocked it off its feet. They built the new box wrong way round, which helps it, I suppose, to keep an eye on the river. There were extensive sidings back of this hotel, and beyond this wall, a weekly market for neighbouring farms. This outhouse was a coal store with its own rail siding coming up through all that greenery. Today it's the only crossing point on the line and for a moment the railway noises are all hushed in the sleepy summer murmur of the toll. And the older traveller in the corner seat dreams of a time of challenge. And driving steam through winter.
Except for the rare signal lamp, you drove by sound. Counting seconds for the next echo. One, two. Beyond the buffer beam, there was nothing but flooded fields from Newbridge to the Pillbridge, the track a causeway between water. And the regulator slammed a shut for the river bend by Portsmouth Arms, where the water would suck every bit of ballast out of the track. There was little to guide you into lamp-lit platforms to make sure your tail end was comfortably in. Otherwise, you gave the customers a ten-foot drop into a ditch. So you tried to pick out of the dark some regular marker to stop your cab opposite a white-painted fence or the red echo of your furnace in greenhouse glass. Young firemen, eager but green, were told to look for a white cab. Rain seared your eyeballs, cascaded off the cab sheet. But the storm made a closer partnership of man and machine. Steam was unpredictable. She'd act like a lady in a heat wave or the cold, then snub you if you fed her on small stuff. Wet sludge turned into cement, and she'd have you on your knees before you got to the climbs. She'd fry your breakfast on a shovel, and freeze your back for arthritis. You had to be her master, know every nut and bolt, how to seal a burst pipe or change a water gauge. Making time up the valley was a goal every trip. And when the woods beat back that mile a minute rhythm, that was teamwork. And there was a pride in keeping it going whatever God sent. Late August, 1978. The lonely up platform, where wild birds nest close to the windows to watch the last trains of summer. A clay train down from Torrington along the Tor, the only remnant of line beyond Barnstable. When the Great Western surveyed its own route into North Devon from Taunton, the London South Western bribed the local gentry to oppose it offering a branch from here to South Moulton. Lord Fortescue challenged their right to deprive thousands of a rail service. Devon wasn't there to await the company's pleasure. The evening train from Exeter comes in for the last lap. The last lap. For train guard beer, it was the first lap, packed with holiday makers bound for home, sore with standing and sunburn, haggling over reservations, juggling the corner seats for the kids, with grannies all facing the engine. The last lap for train guard Woodger, coming into the junction on a streaming night to listen to a story of headlights flying through the air at the Chapleton crossing. But the splinters of an unfastened door showed how the train had knocked the lamps from the level crossing gates.
the last lap for a century of steamers and that very first train in August 1854. And people from the district packed the river banks to watch it rumble over the three iron arches of the Pill Bridge. Over the bridge and into the junction it went. Now all agog with public rejoicing, where officers of the corporation poured corn oil and wine as an oblation. And the provincial grand chaplain offered a prayer to the success of the railway. This former LSWR station, situated on the western edge of the North Devon town, was originally known as Barnstable Junction, but with the decline of services is now simply Barnstable. At one time the town had two stations, the other one situated across the river and known as Barnstable Town. As a junction in the busy days of the steam era, trains regularly arrived and departed to and from Ilfracombe, Linton and from the Torrington area via Biddeford. But since the decline of steam, passenger traffic has indeed fallen drastically and what used to be a crowded centre for travel and enthusiasts has become a very quiet station at times with only remnants of the glory of former days. But thanks to amateur cinematographers such as Norman Taylor who pioneered these images in the late 1950s we can recall the sights of mighty engines and activity that will stir the memory and excite the imagination. In 1936, it was reported that 6,955 wagons were forwarded and 10,567 received at the goods depot. 32,287 passenger tickets were issued and almost 77,000 collected, and that averages almost 300 passengers frequenting the station every day. These images, of course, speak for themselves. early 70s, Standard Tank Local 80039 brought the Exeter Flyer into Barnstable, the last of the steam excursions with a trip down the Ilfracan branch. From the bridge at the north exit we see the old Ilfracan departure platform and the train crosses the Biddeford line to North Signal Box with hand out for token to cross Tor Bridge. 
although there was no chance of colliding, for the last train had long gone. Our final and probably most unique part of the journey takes us from Barnstable to Ilfracombe, but this movie footage from the archives of Victor Thompson dates back to 1898 and surely ranks as some of the earliest moving images available. It appears that a brave 19th century cinematographer with hand-turned camera stood on the front of the train to capture the images you are watching. Let's therefore travel back almost a hundred years and experience a journey into the past, even more impressive than a cab's eye view. And as we go, we can stop and, bridging almost a hundred years of time, take a brief look at how things looked in 1996. As the train moved north from the junction, it crossed the old Tor Bridge. The design of this structure was strongly criticised by residents for its apparent ugliness and only a few tears were shed when it was finally demolished in 1977. The line then ran parallel to Barnstable Quay Station, closed in 1898 and later converted to a bus depot. Further up line, Barnstable Town Station opened in May of 1898 as a result of the inauguration of the Linton and Barnstable Railway was built to replace the Key Station which was too small and geographically ill-situated to cope with the new L and BR. The station today is unused, whilst the old signal box was converted by the Linton and Barnstable Railway Society into an impressive museum and bookshop in 1992. The site has all the welcome views of preservation, at least of buildings if not track. Whilst this station could have been more usefully retained as the terminus of the line from Exeter, it was boarded up and closed despite its proximity to the business centre and bus station. The Linton Barnstable narrow gauge line had just opened on that very day, but not a glimpse of it over here on the right. Our own standard gauge line goes off right to the exchange sidings. The train approached Pottington signal box on the swing bridge, controlling access to Rolls Key siding. The presence of our cameraman on the front of the train appeared to irritate the signal man at the time. Get off! The train now approached Braunton by way of Braunton Burrows, a nature reserve, then along the west bank of the River Cairn to join the line at the old level crossing at Velator, about half a mile from Braunton Station. This, it's hard to believe, was the railroad out of Braunton to Ilfracombe, once the old crossing gates held up queues of holiday cars bound for Saunton. Now, this road signal does the same thing. The station master's house is now a newsagent's and the goods shed is a youth club and in its day Braunton was a very busy station with almost 50,000 ticket collections in 1928 and it was here that additional engines were attached to heavy trains to give added power for the long climb to Mort Ho. Today the old station building is also used as a countryside and health centre. The only other station on this line of track used to be Rafton, where today the buildings are a private dwelling house, but retaining a number of relics, such as the name board, electric lights and signals. Two miles towards Ilfracombe is the old crossing keeper's cottage at Stony Bridge. It was one of the three road crossings between here and Coombe. Although they controlled very minor roads with a minimum of traffic, they added heavy running expenses, which all helped to close the line. Mort Ho and Woolacombe Station still has an air of railway adventure and today has been converted to Once Upon a Time, a children's play and theme park. In 1985, new track and several coaches appeared here, not unfortunately for the reinstatement of train services, but to support the organisation of the children's playground. What used to accommodate the Atlantic Coast Express has given way to a narrow gauge for many people. 
The chocolate and cream of the great western coaches are drawn up to a permanent stop and you peep through windows to marvels on the inside, each compartment booked by fairy tale folk. The centre was the conception of Richard Haynes as an extension of his leisure park at Watermouth Castle. The station was painted out in Southern Rail's Brunswick Green and the chocolate and cream coaches reminding of the Great Western which used to pass through from the 1880s. From Mort Hull Station, our intrepid cameraman captured the silence and solitude of that long drop to Coombe. Today, all that you see here is a free enchantment of a nature trail, buzzing with quiet, a lost world of wild flowers splashed with waterfalls in miniature here and there. The steep inclines and banks on this stretch of line tested the enduring mechanical power of any engine and heralded one of the steepest double-track sections of railway in the country. And as for the tunnels, in the summer hush they have one eye closed. In the half-dark you never know what treasures you may step on, like the bowl of a pipe thrown down maybe by one of the last of the gangers to frequent the line. The area today, with its beautiful park-like surroundings, is still haunted by the memories of the days when the presence of mighty steam engines thundered up and down the banks on this section of line. But no more bankers out of Brompton, just holiday ramblers testing their own heads of steam. The reason for this unique little film is part of cinema history. By 1898, audiences were tired of the first movies, one minute long, actuality only, like rowing a boat, city traffic, knocking down a wall. The Phantom Rides offered you a journey without moving an inch. A coach was set up in a darkened hall, no wheels sitting on springs. Around the windows were cine screens with projectors on the outside, casting movement to passengers. Beneath the coach, large men rocked the springs, all to the accompaniment of chuff-chuff noises. So, for a tanner, one could travel down to the Queen of the West or over the Yorkshire Moors. There were variations of the coach set up to match pictures taken from horse buses or the stagecoach. We saw only the left-hand bore of the tunnels earlier, for when the line was doubled, the extra shaft was excavated amid some excitement. Minutes before the passing of a train, a premature blast brought tons of spoil down onto the line, and disaster was averted, but not, I imagine, a long walk down to the station. And so, the station comes into sight, with a signalman playing the drama out to the end. Will he? Won't he? Down goes the arm, and that long, bleak platform without the elegant canopy comes into view. There's a glimpse of the ample sidings for rakes of passenger stock, to make up trains to Waterloo via Exeter or Taunton and Bristol, or that fast Westbury route to Paddington Direct. And so into Ilfracoo. As the trains approached the old station, it appeared that the site was so high above the town that the drivers feared they would drop off the end of the world. Not only was the approach steep, but a number of severe curves had to be navigated on this 1 in 36 gradient. 
The original station was built to accommodate only short-length trains of the era, but as traffic grew, particularly with the holiday trade, rearrangements had to be made to accommodate the great London expresses. And the station was redesigned and rebuilt by the Southern Railway in 1928-29. PAL Europe now stands at the end of the track and access to the original site is difficult. But Victor Thompson's record of the working line from Ilfracombe to Barnstable, filmed in 1969, is now a vital record of our railway heritage. He called it appropriately, end of the line, not realising at the time how vital images there would be for our modern generation. So this is our final journey, now preserved on film as part of our railway heritage. the summer of 69. She'd be one of the last trains for Ilfracombe, a holiday special. On one of the last stretches of the Withered Arm, the old London and South West Railway, there's bits and pieces of it all around Dartmoor and Devon, empty cuttings, signal cabins, foxgloves over them all, all gone, without a whisper. A holiday special. <laughs> In its heyday, 10,000 people would use that yard on a Saturday. That was why in 1870, a railway meant new hopes, a new prosperity. It nearly developed into a war of rights when the local gentry opposed the line. Windows were smashed, riots broke out, and back along the route where the line must go, the people of Brompton went up on the hill and burnt the squire. Well, an effigy anyway. So in came the navvies, down went the line, and on opening day 1874, they decked out an arch, just here, all in flowers, with London to Ilfracombe, united in bonds of iron. Yet in less than a century, Ilfracombe replaced the bonds with ties of tarmac. Railwaymen, with petitions to sign, were told by hoteliers to change their calls for car parks. Freight out of Ilfracombe died the same way. One six-ton and two three-ton lorries usually worked the station yard. A checker, five clerks and two unloaders manned the goods shed, which has been stacked to the roof whilst another six to ten wagon loads were waiting on the rails outside. The control centre of it all worked to the full with a goods yard, runarounds, coat sidings, turntable and a double main line in and out of Coombe. The Atlantic Coast Express was a regular morning up train, winter and summer. Then there was the Devon Bell and the regular morning circus of getting the observation coach onto the turntable for the return trip. Just a bit of Southern Rail luxury which never paid its way, except Saturdays. You could have filled a rake of coal wagons with passengers on those summer Saturdays. The 8.30 train to Manchester was fondly known as the Palestine Express if cattle had been loaded the same way, there'd have been a summons for cruelty. But for the foreman, it was a pleasure to go to work. They call it the bank, a steady rise of one in thirty, all the way from Ilfracombe to Mort Hole. With no level run for a takeoff, it was one of the toughest starts for heavily packed trains on railways anywhere. It was common for a West Country engine to get stuck on the bank, and it took the fireman's reputation firmly through the mud. There was the pull of the gradient, 
and the pull against the curves. The whole weight of the train ground against the high rail, this one on the outside of the curve. New rails were always being laid. Summertime services kept up to four old veterans on hand to serve as banker engines, sharing the grind and the glory with the shiny West Country class up front. Three pairs of men, driver and fireman, were based at Ilfracoom. Among their own kind, in their own depot, they became legends in their own right. Bertie Johns, George Tucker, Reja Ackland. Bertie Johns was slow and steady, always got there. George Tucker, madder than the March Hare. And the guards got to know these men, became part of the team. On the long, slow haul up the bank, he could tell by the thrust and the sound of the pistons whether there'd be a late start out of Morto. With Bertie Johns, that was unlikely. A man with his lifetime service in steam, he coaxed, coddled and talked the engine up to the summit. Come on, old girl. With a respectful kick of the firebox was all the engine needed to respond to and the men up front to live up to for the team made the power which lived in steam. Pride, too, which kept the brasswork shiny, the gauges at full, and the schedule on time. Though the diesel is easy and don't need a nurse, it's power without soul, and I knows nothing worse. Not every customer spent his time looking at the best coastline in the West. One evening just about here, the guard was told of a passenger who'd taken a can of cream from the luggage van. Cream was carted in seven pound tins. Devonshire cream, so called, made in Wiltshire. The guard asked him what possessed him to steal the stuff and he said he'd been parted from his wife for rather a long time and thought it would make a nice present for her. It proved to be a very expensive one.
there are three of these crossings, all manned, between Mortable and Bronton. A simple locking system prevents the signals showing clear until the gates have been opened. But 40 trains a day working double track puts any system to the test and finds the weakness. That turned out to be the wicket gates, which had no locks. Half a mile down at Hedden Mill, a child waited for an up train to steam by, ran through the wicket gate, straight into the path of the down express. Timetables for the crossing keepers never allowed for illness. His wife would take over his duties immediately, and those warning bells duplicated in the cabin and the cottage would have wakened the dead, let alone one busy housewife. Bronton, a stop for the beach parties for Saunton and Croyd, a yard full of buses, once pony and trap, and the best railway hydrangea, a whole platform long. Well, that was in the days when the staff numbered eight, not two on a shift, and local industries overworked the goods yard. The bulb farm sent a thousand baskets a day, sugar beet, pottery, rabbits up to three tons a day, and there were very special occasions when children lined the fences at a safe distance to see their own rodeo show, loading prize cattle for the Bath and West or Devon County shows. station foreman could remember only one accident. An elderly woman used those faulty wicket gates to cross behind a shunting train, was knocked down and lost an arm. During the war there was a large American army camp nearby, so evening trains had plenty of customers. The late special, fondly dubbed the Bronton Boozer, left Barnstable at 10.30 full and bursting, with a clientele feeling uh, much the same way. Seating problems drifted into luggage racks, even down to the buffers, and the train would stop half a dozen times to the alarm chain being pulled, in mistake for something else, no doubt. All right, so it's just another branch line closing down. But it's closing down people, too. Forty years of a man's career, Porter, guard, station master. It's closing down a bit of history. Four years of slog with pick and shovel, cutting that road up through the bank, making a mountain top at Coombe. It's closing down nearly a century of steamers, whistling up through the valley, pushing through fog on a winter's night, still on time, or coming through the dawn two hours late from a bombing raid at Waterloo.
there's still the ghost of a railway up through the strand a remnant of town station with car parks smothering the old road from Paddington or Waterloo but you can trace out its track over the River Yeo with the old swing bridge once snared a catch on the incoming flood the only instance where timetables had to wait on the tides and for years Bronton station was left to bleach in summer suns and the bones buried themselves deeper into the greenery until winter came to stir dead leaves into a frenzy as though long dead trains had passed but the house at Henton no longer a residence for the lord of the manor is humbled as a country club although it still survives and below it a gradient cross marks where the railway died 